All right. Thank you everyone for joining us for today's live webinar with CNCF. AKS and SPIN integration. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's live webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct and then hand over to Ralph Squillis, Principal Product Manager, Azure Core Upstream at Microsoft. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to speak, but there is a chat box. Please go ahead and pop your questions in there as we go. Ralph is ready to get to your questions. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct and please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They're also available via your registration link you use today, and the recording will be on our online program's YouTube playlist. With that, I will hand things over to Ralph to kick it off. All right. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Somebody give me a thumbs up uh, or the equivalent of a thumbs up in the, uh, in the chat just to make sure we're doing okay. All right. We've got one. That means we're doing okay. Uh, thank you very much, Libby, and I'm really, really pleased to be here. Um, the uh, high order bit is is talking about WebAssembly and seeing how easy it is to get started and make things work. But we also want to talk about uh, the areas where WebAssembly is difficult so that you're aware of them, don't get frustrated when you bump into them and so forth. And we can also talk about the future of these areas, like that. when will they improve, when will this be uh, super ready to use where you won't even think about anything and so forth. We'll just cover the whole gamut. And we'll also talk uh, generally about uh, WebAssembly itself and the component model. These are the, you know, the questions like why we do these things and, and so forth are very, very important um, as engineers and uh, as people in the business of software, um, depending where you are in the, in the entire ecosystem of the world. Um, Sometimes the business questions are more important than the engineering questions, and sometimes the engineering questions are more important than the business questions. And those are very different things. So we can talk about those kinds of things as well. And I am going to walk you through a good portion of uh, the SPIN uh, Fermion uh, workshop that we did collaboratively um, with the Fermion team at KubeCon in Chicago, just to give you an idea of how easy this is. So I did drop a link into the chat. Uh, but we'll, you know, I'll reiterate it and you'll see the, the links when we get to the demo part of the, of the session. And so you can actually install this and follow along. It's really easy to do. It takes about mm, maybe five, 10 minutes to set up uh, your machine, depending on whether you have Docker uh, desktop installed, depending on whether you need to install spin 2.0.1. And uh, also things like uh, let's see what else, uh, the language that you intend to use. And so we'll go through those various areas. We'll build a couple of languages, um, but, and we will also show you the difference in performance, which is really, really critical between, uh, native spin, um, modules with different languages because different languages have different performance characteristics. We'll show you that. And also the comparison between, uh, web assembly standalone and web things like uh, containerized WebAssembly, like in Kubernetes. Very, very different experience. And there are little bits of overhead there that are, uh, that are important to be aware of. Um, all of these are just normal engineering differences. They're not uh, as a result of anything going wrong. They're a result of very different choices at the engineering level, at the technical level. So let's get started. Um, to do that, I've got a little bit of an introduction on WebAssembly. I want to make sure that we're all in the same uh, boat more or less and let's see I got that started so let's go back to the webinar page and I'm going to share my screen and then first you're going to get inception and then we'll jump over to um, the actual screen so we're going to do the entire screen here uh, in theory that should be okay I'm going to hide my screen we now have inception so I'm going to go over here uh, and so in theory uh, everybody can see AKS and SPIN 101 to Zoom. So we're going to go from the very beginnings all the way up to burning a whole bunch of cores really fast. 
Um, my name is Ross Guachi. As Libby said, I'm on the Azure Core Upstream team. I'm also the Microsoft board member for the Bytecode Alliance Foundation. That foundation provides the legal and engineering resources to ensure that uh, more than, I believe now, more than 2,000 developers are in the ecosystem that we know of, messaging, communicating, and, and committing. Uh, it's quite a, quite a substantial group of people, all of whom are committing um, to one of the repositories, things like runtimes like WebAssembly, uh, Micro Runtime, or Whammer, and Wasm Time, in addition to all the tooling necessary for the WebAssembly component model. All of that work ends up, if it's a specification, ends up in the W3C, um, or is a tool that is generally available for anybody to use. And we love to have you do it. So here's the abstract. Uh, we, this was on the um, front page of the site for the webinar. Um, but first, we're going to talk about WebAssembly itself. Then we're going to talk about how you make these things into Kubernetes. And then we're going to actually do it. And uh, we're going to use Spin because it's a re really one of the more fantastic serverless platforms to run WebAssembly. And we're going to show you the differences. Uh, great. So first, let's talk about why we do this WebAssembly thing, right? The problem space that we're in uh, doesn't initially seem like a problem space unless you've been really working on containers for a while. And it also doesn't seem like a problem space if you've been doing native code, like if, you, especially in particular, there's a lot of artisanal native code still on the edge, like not in hyperscale cloud native, not in Kubernetes, for example. And both crowds might think this isn't really, a, they don't really have a problem. There's so many more things that they have yet to improve on. And that's probably true. But for a lot of people, we've been working on containers for 10 plus years now and Kubernetes for quite a while. And what you realize is that you want to do things with containers that are really, you just can't do. And a lot of them revolve around the fact that containers are essentially too much VM-ish, right? And we'll get to what that means. So before we get to that, though, we want to talk about the core feature set of WebAssembly. And the first one is that it is actually essentially a cloud-native binary. And if we think of containers as sort of a cloud-native application, that's the way we sort of thought about it for a while. But it's really a cloud-native operating system with an application on it. Um, WebAssembly is extremely small. It's essentially a binary format for uh, an abstract virtual machine. And as a result, you compile it to a binary. Like you compile to a WebAssembly module. And it's very, very different than the Docker container um, experience that we're used to with containers, for example. And it also makes things very small. And I'll give you an example. Um, so, and you're, you're thinking about containers. Some of the containers are very, very large. That's not really the, the important thing. Those do get smaller. But let's take a very small container, like a Go language um, container that we have. When we were compiling one of our Go language operators, which is only about 12 megabytes. And we compiled that down to WebAssembly, and we got that down to 176 KB. And that's a substantial reduction. If uh, you have a big language with a big runtime and things like that, the reduction might not be so much. But at the same time, something like .NET, for example, um, which is a substantial runtime, can be contained at about 50, 50 or 60 megabytes. Um, for a, a very optimized container. But compiling down to WebAssembly, we immediately dropped within the realm of 12, 10 megabytes, and we believe we can get it down below five. And so there are, really are scales of, of difference between size here. The second bit is that we have a by, uh, by default deny security stance. And we had to have this because WebAssembly was born in the browser. Was it born in order to enable complex languages, uh, advanced languages, C and Rust and other languages like that, to compile and be able to host in a JavaScript engine? And it turns out it works really, really well. But to do that, the browser has to have complete control over what the module is able to do. And that means the browser, the host of WebAssembly, is able to opt in to behaviors that the module may wish to perform. Unlike containers where you have direct access to the kernel, the container essentially 
can be prevented from doing things in the kernel. But otherwise, the container believes and by default has access to the kernel, which is an extremely large uh, surface to attack. And so that becomes a very, very difficult thing to secure, even though the industry's made tons of changes. The other one, it has to do with portability. It's WebAssembly is language agnostic, as in abstract virtual specification, right? Um, any language could, in theory, compile to it. And many, if not most, do in some way, shape, or form, for better or for worse, depending on the languages. And I'm expecting some questions about that kind of thing. I'll, I'll be happy to discuss it. But it's also OS agnostic. Think about running inside a browser. You'd have to be able to run on Windows and on Mac and on Linux and things like this. And so the operating system can't be relevant at all. So it isn't. And that allows one module to move from one operating system to the other. And finally, it's CPU architecture agnostic. Think about, again, browsers. They have to be able to run on ARM. They have to be able to run on AMD. But more importantly, they often run on very strange chips indeed. And so as a result, so does WebAssembly. And that language OS and CPU agnosticism, if you will, can bring it to almost any location because it's very small. And so it's location agnostic. You can run it almost anywhere. So these are the key feature sets, but what do we mean really, what is WebAssembly, right, and why? I've stolen this keynote uh, slide from Luke Wagner at Fastly, distinguished engineer there, and a key uh, designer and contributor to the component model and WebAssembly. And it, the link, you'll get this deck, and the link is the YouTube keynote from WasmCon, which was in September. And Luke laid it out like this. WebAssembly is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. And that's abstract stack-based virtual machine. In other words, there is no physical machine that's, that's designed this way. You need a runtime to present this machine to your WebAssembly um, and execute it. And Wasm then is designed as a portable compilation target. So you shouldn't think of it so much as a web a virtual machine in the sense of hypervisor, right? It is a generalized virtual machine, but the specification for executing one is not a hypervisor. It's in fact a WebAssembly runtime. And from the language point of view, you should be able to compile your native code directly to WebAssembly to get the advantages of WebAssembly, portability, OS, language, and runtime agnosticity, and so forth. So how does that look like? So if we think about regular languages that we use in developer, right? Go, R, JavaScript, C, C Sharp, PHP, Java, all of these things, right? Normally, they would be compiled out to a specific operating system or a specific architecture like you see here. And some languages that do interpretation, like Python or JavaScript, we'll have actually the compilation target will, will take place inside the JavaScript runtime. It'll be parsed and interpreted um, or ahead of time compiled for the specific um, our, uh, operating system and architecture, right? So the glory of WebAssembly is that because almost all languages can target it, you could compile directly to WebAssembly. And if you did that, a browser or a Wasm engine or a WASM engine on a phone or a browser on a phone or a device can in fact automatically handle the translation between architectures and operating systems for you, which means your language can be compiled once and can run in all of those places. Now that's a very interesting experience, right? And Luke had said the wins are portability, determinism and control flow integrity. And those two determinism and control flow integrity, those have to do with the fact that the uh, code, the, the specification for WebAssembly does not allow arbitrary creation of memory. And so things like go-tos and infinite loops and so forth don't really exist. That's actually a good thing because it means you can programmatically examine a module or even test a runtime for conformance to ensure that the sandbox uh, is not broken out of or that you're not leaking memory anywhere or 
violating somebody else's memory. And that's really cool. And, th and that, along with the specification for a sandbox, um, which was required for browser hosting, as you can imagine, gives us the ability to start and protect any module from the memory of any other module or the host and do it lightning speed. This is really fantastic. So my modification, this is my modified version, is the winds are portability, security, size, and speed. By default, nobody can do anything with your, with your module. And to get an idea of what this really means, if you think about uh, last year's Log4j um, issue with malicious code that basically assumed it had operating system-wide access, but if you didn't notice that it was compiled as a dependency for your application, it would go ahead and use the operating system to exfiltrate data and credentials. That can't happen in WebAssembly by default. You can only opt into that ability and that's something that you can control, but in a container environment, it's very, very hard to do that a priori for all of the containers that you wish to run and all the dependencies therein, okay? So when we get concrete, what you want is a list like this. This comes from a, um, a, uh, a presentation that I saw that was actually pretty good. And you can see that like for several aspects, WebAssembly might be several megabytes in reality we target for well under a megabyte if we possibly can, and it depends what you're trying to run. If you're running something like a Postgres server in uh, WebAssembly, it might be more than a several megabytes. But if you're running a serverless function, it might be as little as several hundred KB, and that's fantastic because it's really what you want to target. A container, on the other hand, extremely large and laughing at the hundreds of megabytes because I routinely see uh, containers that are well more than a gigabyte and still fully functional as a server, as, as a service, because the developer doesn't have to pay for the big network and the big machines. And if they don't have to pay, they don't have to optimize. And so there's really kind of a, a what you might call a disciplinary and operational um, mismatch there. Startup time is, for WebAssembly used to be referred to as milliseconds. That's not actually true. Um, for a no-op WebAssembly, you can start from cold and enter a WebAssembly function in low nanoseconds. And you will see that millisecond startup time is actually not considered very good. We're actually going to show you that. And I'm going to describe the problems with my machine that result in mere microseconds instead of, instead of nanoseconds. It's possible that, uh, that you can get into the nanoseconds yourself with spin. Containers start in seconds, but the bigger they are, the more those seconds stretch out into even minutes but they're still much better than VM. And performance speed, WebAssembly is usually said to be kind of about 10% of native speed, but it really varies on what you're trying to do. Uh, if in fact you want to run at native speed, you can certain kinds of workloads, uh, especially if you ahead of time compile, um, but you're not really going to get close to 10% of native speed if you're doing all kinds of heavy work uh, that WebAssembly is not really leaning into yet. So WebAssembly also runs in the browser. Uh, Cross-platform portability is extremely high. All the standards are in W3C and OCI, uh, and also the CNCF. So we're going to show you the RunWASI project in Container D. And system interactions, we use WASI or the WebAssembly system interfaces or standard interfaces to model an underlying OS and virtualize it. And we'll show you a little bit what those mean later on. This isn't exactly, uh, as you can see, the current way of interpreting, but it gives you some idea of the differences that we're looking at here. Now, why, what and why this WebAssembly thing? Let's get back to the whole VM-ish problem. So what, what do we really mean with that? So what we really mean is that essentially VMs were a tremendous advance on bare metal code, code that was native, running on a bare metal uh, installation of an operating system. And that, though that code was built and created, especially if you're talking about Linux and open source code, often the core uh, code bases were created 20, 30, 40 years ago. And what we're doing is bringing forward all of the assumptions that that code made. And much of our security uh, and supply chain issues that we're dealing with now in the container ecosystem 
really are a result of the fact that all of that code assumed it had full OS permissions. Everybody loves root. Um, if I could get my daughter to uh, behave properly when I called out sudo, I would love that, but that's not the way humans work. And it really isn't actually the way we want code to work in the future. It is true that containers essentially sold themselves based on like containing an application, but that application was actually bundled up with an operating system in it as layers and so forth. And the only thing that was really shared was the kernel. And that meant that the assumptions of the code you brought with it were the essentially the assumptions of full operating system permission. With containers, if you don't have to boot, boot the kernel, you turns out you come up pretty fast. And that's really nice when you're comparing yourself with VMs and, you know, and so forth and native code if you had to boot the OS in the beginning. But in reality, these features really impact Kubernetes. And it turns out that Kubernetes is limited in its usage scenarios, not because Kubernetes has any inherent problem, but because the features that you need are not container features. So to make Kubernetes useful in more scenarios and at less cost, what you really want are smaller, uh, smaller, excuse me, more responsive clusters. And that cost will, that will drive cost down. And by smaller clusters, you'd like to be able to have a fewer nodes. You'd like to have those nodes running on smaller SKUs, for example, or maybe even an ARM, right, uh, SKU, so that, in fact, you can pay 20 or 30% less, depending on where you're doing your cloud hosting, for example. You'd also want to run clusters in small, heterogeneous spaces. Um, maybe you're a restaurant and you want to run one cluster with one node for each point of sale, cashier, cash register, cash register that you have. Maybe you want to just have a serve HTML5 and push buttons. And that a regular Kubernetes distribution doesn't really serve itself, lend itself to that environment. There's very little IT support. Um, it's hard to keep things running. And so when you do, you want something that's a lot more flexible. You also have older machines. You have different architectures. Not everything's the same. And your networks are weak. So you can't use a big, huge container. So that's really important. WebAssembly helps address these situations and it brings Kubernetes to new places where otherwise you wouldn't expect it to appear, if at all. And finally, you can ignore nodes and pods and let the ops team, ops team choose SKUs. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it's hard to know what that means until you see it. And I'm going to show you in just a second. All of this stuff I'm talking about right now is purely open source. It's the best of the CNCF. Container D is the vanilla shim with run C inside. And there is a run WASI shim project there, which you can use. And we're going to show you how that works um, in a little bit. And mo most of the WebAssembly stuff that we're going to use is hosted or related to the BCA or the CNCF. For example, WASM Edge is in the CNCF and WASM Time, which we're going to use here and Whammer and other uh, tools to uh, run and use components are in um, the BCA. And we're also going to uh, highlight, I also want to highlight KWASM, which is a, a great open source project that allows you to install the Kubernetes shims, the run WASI shims, almost anywhere, uh, which means you can run what we're going to run tonight in AKS, in Azure, Azure Kubernetes service, or you can use Google uh, Kubernetes engine, or you can use um, EKS on Amazon or anywhere you wish, whether it's on-prem or whether it's in a cloud hoster that you prefer. So we'll show you how that works. So we're gonna do this with K3Ds and AKS. If we have time, we may or may not have time, but we'll figure, it out, figure out whether we do. But before we do this, we wanna show you, uh, I wanna step back a moment Come to um, the chat and I want to look in, see if everybody's got any questions. I see Jeff, you seem to be helping people out, which is great. We are going to, in fact, use 2.0.1. What I want to do is show you a little demo. Um, this is Fermion Spin right there. Let's get back here. Here's the demo I want to show you. And this is a demo that gives you an idea of what kind of features 
the WebAssembly gives Kubernetes. This is an AKS cluster, and it's a special kind of cluster. So when I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this, let's see if this works. Um, it's a little fuzzy at first, probably because of the upload and download. There it goes. And you can see this cluster doesn't have anything, but it does have a Windows AMD node pool. It also has a Linux AMD node pool. And it also has uh, a Linux ARM node pool. So this is a very different kind of cluster. And normally when you deploy containers to something cluster like this, you'd have to use taints and tolerations and node selectors with labels and the whole thing to make sure that your containers got deployed to the node that supported them. And I wanna demonstrate that here. This is a simple two container app and you can see that we get a lot of misscheduled containers. The, the, uh, the image won't pull because it, uh, the container shim will not load anything. If we sit there and deploy the same kind of application that is built with WebAssembly, you'll see a different effect, right? I'm going to show uh, five different applications, and they're all running, and they distribute. Now, look at the node pools. You can see that, that in fact, WebAssembly, the same module, will deploy on Windows, AMD, or ARM. And we're going to prove that to you. We're going to go ahead and destroy one of the node pools, just delete it right out from under the cluster. And you should expect that we would see Kubernetes native uh, understanding that in fact, we need to terminate things and redeploy them. And you can see them happening here. This one happens fast. We only killed one node pool, but let's kill the other one. And in this case, the only node pool running will be the Windows node pool at the end. Now let's watch what happens. And just for a moment, there it goes, terminating and creating. And you can see at this point, right, the only container running happened to be scheduled to the, the master node pool. And that's okay. But all the others are not working at all. And yet all the other web assemblies have now been rescheduled to Windows. Now there's nothing Windows specific about this. And so what you can imagine here, what you're really looking at is the way that WebAssembly abstracts the details of the node away. There are no node pool selectors here. There are no taints and tolerations. Now your operations team, if it wants, and you're running uh, um, WebAssembly, it can actually deploy to nodes that are ARM and immediately see a 20 or 30%. Uh, savings. So that gets really fun. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this. And I'm going to go ahead and move here. And what we're going to do, let's move here and then move here. I'm going to drop through the incredible thing. What we're doing is you can see that this is the uh, getting started. I want to show you how this works um, uh, from the setup. And I don't know if you can see okay. I hope you can. You can look at this setup and you can see what we're going to do is we're going to install this. This installation right here, I believe, will give you spin 1.51. I actually go ahead and just do um, uh, spin 2.01, which is the latest. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate for you. And so you should be able to follow along without too much trouble. I'm also going to use the TypeScript one and the Go one, which requires, and the Go, uh, excuse me, TypeScript, if you'll notice, you click here, TypeScript requires NPM. So get node and NPM involved. And the Tiny Go one will require Tiny Go. And so you're going to need Tiny Go, uh, Go, right? And the version you want is latest and you'll need 0 .30, 0 0.30, okay? So, if you'd like to follow along, this is the way to do it, but you don't have to. I'm gonna actually walk you through everything. So, if we're gonna do this, that's the installation steps. You can use the dev container. This does provide you with 1.51 and compatible um, dependencies. But as I say, we're gonna do this live on 2.01.
to see whether uh, I can get in trouble, right? So first to get started with Spin and WebAssembly. Now what I'm gonna do is I've cloned this over here as you can see, right? And if I do this, we'll go to the code and I can go ahead and here, I, I can open the preview of WebAssembly. In fact, it opened right away. I'm gonna get this out of the way and you can see we're here at the setup again. So instead, I'm gonna open up the preview to this. This is where we're starting. And this is a quick reference to get up and going. Now I'll walk through this, but we'll also make sure we're checking and see if we can catch any errors or documentation errors because I'd love to submit a PR uh, if anything is mistaken. Now the easy way to do this in VS Code is just to open this up here, so I'll do so. Um, I hope that you can see that easily enough. So we'll move this over here. And the critical thing is we're gonna talk about spin new. Let's do spin version. Just to make sure you can see that I'm using this spin version 2.0.1. And it says, hey, spin new, let's do that. And in fact, I said I was gonna do JavaScript. So I'm gonna do JavaScript. Uh, HTTP REST request handler. Uh, all of these are request handlers right now. And that gives you the idea that, in fact, this is a fantastic serverless um, uh, a platform that's been, uh, that Fermion has here. And so we're going to say, hey, uh, new JS um, function. Okay. Description. You can just delete through those. Um, or excuse me, and enter through those. And when you get done, you can actually see that we've got a new new JS function. We go to CD to new. Okay, I get a little bit more room. And if we do tree, um, tree is apparently having a great time not running. So I'm gonna clear that and just say LS. Whoops, I didn't clear that here. Wow. Clear, there we go. So in fact, why we're not reading, I'm not really sure, but I'm not gonna hang up on that problem for a moment. You can see the spin toml file is described here, right? And we're gonna actually end up building an application. And that application is going to be WebAssembly and we're telling the, uh, the component, that we're telling spin that the component will be called this and it will be located here. Um, you will exclude, that is not build into the module, the, the node stuff, that'll got all get compiled down into WebAssembly. There's the route. And when you do a build command, you can specify custom builds commands in here. So one of the things that, the, um, that we do with the, the uh, versioning, right? I'm gonna skip over the language stuff because we are gonna in fact use the uh, TypeScript application. So you're, you notice it's npm run build. So we're going to have to um, actually do uh, npm install first. We'll let that come in. And in fact, there we go. Coming in relatively slowly. I'm not necessarily surprised that my network connection is waiting for a kind of fun. We've got no vulnerabilities, which is a miracle. And we can now do spin build. And you'll see that it's going ahead and building the module and optimizing by using the wiser tool and then smashing the size down using a wasm op. You don't have to do this. Spin does this for you to make it as success as easy as possible for you. So if you do now a spin up, in fact, you get a new service. And we open a browser, sure enough, hello from JS SDK. Now let's give you an idea of what we're doing here. So notice that we've got this in uh, VS Code. We've got this running here, okay? Localhost 3000. So if we go ahead and curl HTTP localhost 3000, we get it, hello from JS, that's fantastic. But I wanna use a tool called Hey. And if you don't know about Hey, you should. It's a great load tool very basic and very easy. And it gives us a sense of performance density, right? 
this is super useful. So we're going to say, I want 5,000 requests and I want them on five connections for the same endpoint. Whoop, local host, 3,000. Now the first one involves downloading. Well, look at this. So just out of the gate, that's 10th of a second. That's a hundredth of a second. That's a millisecond. And we did not even reach a millisecond. This is five microseconds for the fastest one. And you may think that that's not very good, or maybe you think that is very good. But notice that the average is eight microseconds. Now, I'm running on Windows inside WSL, and I'm streaming network connection from it. If we add all the overhead and remove that extra processing that we happen to be doing, you can imagine that this is going to drop down. And is that repeatable? Actually, it is not only repeatable, but it actually gets better in many respects. Right? So that's fascinating. Look at how good that is. That's really nuts. So great stuff. Now, if we go ahead and take that back, let's do something else. Let's do something like Go, because it gives us a clear idea of the differences that languages have. Now, if we do spin new, and we say, hey, we're going to use Go with Tiny Go, the Go language component support is coming along uh, sometime in the next half year. I would hope that they support Preview 2, which is what we're using. Um, so this is uh, my Go and no description and so forth. And remember for this one, I have to have tiny Go installed because we need a compiler for our Go. It turns out to tiny Go actually compiles Go code, so you need Go involved, installed as well. But once you do that, you can just do spin build. Whoops, I got to now go into my Go directory. My apologies. And I can do spin build. And you see that I'm actually building tiny Go, build target WASI, go ahead and leak GC. There's a reason for that. Eliminate debug symbols and go ahead and build main.wasm. And there we are. So now I can do spin up. And sure enough, if I open that up, we got hello Fermion in, um, in Go. Okay, great. But how does this stack up? So here we are, we're going to run the same program in Go. Let's let it run a couple of times so that we got all it, everything cached. Do it one more time. Now look at our histogram. The fastest was in fact down to 0002. Now that's actually unexpected. And I actually, usually the Go takes a little bit longer. So this is super thrilling to see. And remember, we've got nested virtual machines going on here and so forth. That's really interesting. So I'm glad to see it. We go back, we go back here, and we go ahead and tear that down. And we're good to go. So far, so good. I'm going to jump back in here to our webinar and see um, what we got. There you go. Yeah, uh, Jeff notes uh, that the downloads, the binary is all really you need. You need the signature file if you're going to validate uh, the download and make sure you do that. The documentation for spin has uh, the cosine command to validate that. Um, when you do do the tree, uh, as Jeff seen, you, but you actually get tree in your console. I'm not really sure why tree is hanging up in WSL right now, but we'll figure that out later. Um, so if there's any other questions, Remember to jump, dump, dump them in here. Um, you're not seeing the response from the Java, the, uh, the, the servlet? No, I'm gonna, yep. Okay, so let's do a couple of diagnostic things. We'll work with you here, Jeff. No obvious content. So here's what the servlet is if I do this. So I'll, let's see, I'm gonna clear. If I list, uh, we got new JS function. So I'm going to CD the new JS function and I'm going to do spin up. 
So if I hit this, okay, with, are you hitting it with a browser or are you hitting it with um, curl? Right. So here's what it looks like with curl. Curl, HTTP, local host, um, 3000, right? And so what you get is like no return. If you don't notice it, it's like there because there's no, there's no, run, there's no uh, extra new line. In the in the return and so you can actually say if you want to do curl you can do curl v and then you get the whole return and that probably will help you out yeah you can add new lines too right so in fact i'll do that while you're doing this right i'm going to go here and i'm going to get rid of that and i'm going to go back to my code um let's see here was my go j new s function source and i'm going to go like here hello from jsk but this is ralph um and we save it and we go ahead and cd new js function and we go ahead and spin build right and spin up spin up Oop. and it says already in air in, in service so that port i got a kill Yep, that's the spin trigger auto forwarded. So stop forwarding port. Okay, there we go. Let's do that again. Terminal and up. Oh, OS error. I wonder if this is a. Do I have it running over here? Yes, I do. Bad man. Right. So we'll spin up over here. Now we have it running. And if we do this again, we're going to get that. But you can see that this is Ralph. Right. So that should be the experience up here. I'm going to come back here. Jeff, do you, are you having that experience? Okay. Um, we're at 743. We're doing fine. I got other things to show, but I'd like to get you, get you running here. Ah, okay. So, uh, but you know, the, the truth is, the spin build failing, you need to do NPM install first. Did you do that? Because we're in JavaScript, remember? If you're in Tiny Go, you don't need to do that because Tiny Go, Go doesn't need you to do that. Ah, go ahead and try it. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna move on to the container. Right, but build won't make a difference. It's gotta be NPM install first. Oh, did? Jeff, let's say, let's just say me talking to you about it made it magically happen. And as a developer, this has happened to us all the time. So like, fine. Yep. NPM will eventually get called, but it's like spin build. If you look at spin build, right? If we go over here and look at our spin toml, right? It should be NPM run build. But in fact, whether npm run build actually calls install first really depends on your configuration so npm can get called there right if you look at the uh using typescript one what they really want you to do is make sure you install the application dependencies first and so forth now what we really want to do next is run this in a container and that's kind of interesting now, the thing I'm gonna show you is that I'm working in WSL. And whether you're on a Mac or WSL or on Linux, the easiest way to get this all running for yourself uh, requires a special configuration of tooling. And it, the easiest place to get that is Docker Desktop. And that's just because Docker has done a really great job here. I'm gonna clear this up. Docker version gets you exactly what you need. You can see that this is Docker Desktop. And you'll note that the actual versions are really good. You're going to need a container D version of 1.625 or above. You also have Docker wired up to build kit. So Docker, we're going to do Docker build X, which requires, and if you do a version of Docker build X, you're going to need at least, I think it's 11.6 or above, might be 11.8. But Docker desktop gives you the newest version. And it's very, very nice that way. Okay, so 
To move into the container space, in other words, to actually be able to deploy this in Kubernetes, it, it gets packaged in a container. We're going to go and do this. So let's go ahead and do this. We're going to say running in a container. So if we go ahead and run in a container, we're going to do this with our thing. We're going to actually create a Docker file. And so to do that, copy, we're going to go ahead and tear down our thing. We're going to use our JavaScript function and we're going to create a Docker file. Okay. And we're going to create the new Docker file. And Jeff, I can't wait. If you got this running, you should be able to follow along if you have Docker desktop installed. Um, we're going to go ahead and drop this into the Docker file. Now note, we actually have to modify this to make sure that the targets are correct. So the target is actually new J function. So we got to do new J function, new JS function, wasm. And in this case, uh, we got to write it again because why would we not have to write it again? <clears throat> new JS function of wasm. Okay. So we've done that. And then we can use this. Now, this is Docker build, build X. You're, you, when you do a Docker build, build, a build, build X build, you're using build kit underneath the hood. But Docker desktop takes care of that for you. So you don't really need to know about the build, uh, the build kit part. However, Notice a couple of things in here. One, we need to tag it and it needs to be tagged with the name of our thing. So I'm actually going to call it the same thing just to make sure it's clear. Um, we're in new JS function and my GitHub ID is Squilachi, my last name, which is nice. It's always good to have a great, uh, strange last name because then you get to use your last name as an alias for almost everything. It's really nice. Um, I feel bad for the Joneses, Johnson Smiths um, of the world. So there's one other little bit you need to do here for sure. And that's this one. Whoops. Uh, this provenance equals false step. There's a reason for that and I'll explain it. But basically this tells Docker build, uh, build kit to not attach provenance information in the image. Uh, in the image manifest. And the reason for that is because Kubernetes does not yet know what that provenance image is. It gets tagged as unknown platform and Kubernetes will refuse to pull it, um, even though the module is in a container and that's fine. You're gonna build this as a type of platform wasi wasm and you're gonna go ahead and use the, the, um, the build context that is right here. So we're going to go ahead and do that. You can see that that's all done. Yay. So if I do go over here just to have more room and do Docker uh, image list, right? You can see that I've got new JS function up here and it's tagged for G GHCR. Oh, I don't want that actually. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use Docker hub just for fun. And so I'm going to build it again. And now I should have another one, which is just Docker Hub. It makes it easier, but uh, you can see that you can tag it anyway. It's just a container. And I do want you to point out the size of your container here. Look at that. 837 KB. It's really quite amazing how small this can be. Um, yeah, so you don't think you're Dr. Garvey. Yeah, you'll skip ahead and you'll just watch this. Um, and it's possible that, uh, editing might've provoked, uh, the correct dependency sequence. It's possible. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. So back here, um, to this, no, to this. So you can see the size of the container we just created. Now let's do this. If we go here to running in the container, okay, we built and now we want to run it and we're going to run it as a background item and we're going to actually use not the GHCR. We're going to use the, the image we could in this particular case, right? But instead we're going to go ahead and use 
the image we just built, which is, I got to type my own name correctly, um, new JS function. Okay. And there it is. Ooh. Spin binary not involved. Ah, okay. Here's the interesting thing. Look at this. If we go to the Toml, excuse me. Uh, no, 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 not to the Toml. You see right here, we did this. Okay, this is a Docker desktop and a Docker thing. What we're doing is telling Docker, go ahead and use this shim to run this, but this is spin v1. We actually don't have v1 loaded, we have v2 loaded, because we're using spin 2.0.1. And so in fact, now it's running. How do we know it's running? Well, in theory, we should be able to do this. The thousand. And sure enough, it's running. Well, great. Can we do that whole thing that we do over here with hey in 5000 uh, C5 HTTP local host? I always forget the L. 3000. Now watch what happens. Do you remember how fast this ran? It ran in in low single digit microseconds. Right? Look at the difference. Now we're into milliseconds for the fastest. Right, we can rerun it. We're still doing pretty well, but we're into milliseconds. We've dropped from 11,000 requests a second to 2,600. That's really quite amazing. So if we do Docker PS, you know what that one's going. So Docker kill 5902, we're gonna go ahead and kill that. But now let's do spin up, okay? And remember, so we just did this one. We just did this one. We're gonna do the same command, boom. Do it again. Incredibly lower. In this case, we ended up at 66,000 instead of whatever we were doing. 6,000, no problem. We go back here to the container one, we're looking at 2,600. So in, in, in an environment that is not virtually looped, right, like where you don't have a bunch, that difference is really amazing at scale, right? Let me make sure we're plugged in here. That's, that difference is really amazing at scale. So now we're at the very end of our hour. Do people have general questions or should I try and pull off a Kubernetes installation? Installation. Trools, you're, uh, Libby, you're provoking me just in case Trules didn't, didn't, didn't jump on it. Okay, exactly. so we're gonna do it. Okay, here we're gonna do it. We got five minutes to not only build a cluster Okay, let's do it. We're gonna build a cluster and we're going to run clear. Okay, we go over here. Now we're gonna deploy Kubernetes, right? So Kubernetes, we're gonna create and configure the cluster. Now notice, I'm gonna change some things. There's a newer thing here. You have, for this one, you have to have K3Ds on, but we, K3D, but we know that there is a newer brand new Shim. So we're going to go ahead and create our cluster. Now watch what happens. Let me create K3Ds. And then we're going to go ahead and watch it. Come on. Oh, it's almost there. Okay. Now I can do cube control, get po, and we'll look at all of them. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and do a watch so that we 
Now, what's happening now is we have to pull in inside of Kubernetes all the internal uh, internal containers that make Kubernetes run. So this is going to be our big uh, hit, our time hit here. But let's go back and map out our thing. So deploy, we've got to create a runtime. We're going to add the shim. And once we do that, right, we can go ahead and import our uh, image to the K3D's cluster. That we can do. And once we do that, we can actually, this is the only difference. We can go ahead and match the image name, right? And the only difference between a container YAML and WebAssembly YAML is that runtime class. That's it. There's no other difference, right? So this is the one where we're we're pulling in brand new brand new images. Oh, we've got it. We've got one running. Let's see if we can pull it off. We're at 757. And we're going to do this. Okay, we've got that. Deploy the cluster. We're going to touch the spin runtime while we're doing that. Over here, okay. Uh, okay, and we'll touch spin runtime YAML, and we'll add this to the file. Okay, and I'll spin run run runtime YAML. Beep. Great thing about me is I come with sound effects. I come with my own beep sounds, and we're going to go ahead and add that to the cluster at some point, right? But we gotta wait till the cluster's up and running. We're almost running. You can see we're getting in our traffic uh, service load balancers. That's almost there. Two minutes left. Almost, almost. Okay, we got traffic running. The jobs are completing, and we're waiting for the last, the last traffic manager completed. It's done. We got running, 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 running. Great, fantastic. Okay. Now we can do things like this. Get over here. Um, we're in Nanum runtime, and so now we want to install. We're, we're, this shim command already has the container D shim in, involved in it, and so what we need to do is tell Kubernetes that it's there. And so we do K uh, cube control apply F uh, spin. Whoops, spin. Um, I'm typing as fast as I can, I promise. Okay, we've got that, right? And then we do this, um, and this, uh, my application, Wasm cluster image import my application is Scolacci, whoops, Scolacci. I'm typing as fast as I can, new JS function, okay? And it says, okay, I'm importing that. So now we're adding the, this image is now in the cluster's cache. Right, and then you can touch uh, the. You can create a spin app, YAML. Okay, we did that. Whoop! Uh, got the star. I've got one more minute. Can I pull it off? Uh, touch spin app YAML. Make the sure. I mean, yeah. Okay, image import. Uh, yeah, we already did the image import, so we're gonna do this. Nano spin app YAML. Boom, uh, X, yeah, do, okay. And then once that's ready, we go ahead and apply the spin app right here. And I'm so close, will it work? Created, watch, cube control, get po, and container is creating five seconds. Please do not blow up because what we did is we imported the container, error image pull, boom. Oh, that's unfortunate. All right. We almost did it. We almost did it. What I'm going to do is go ahead and jump to uh, this just to show you that we can do this. No problem. If you're deploying from Kubernetes, from outside Kubernetes. Um, let's see. We had Wasm time spin. Let's see. What was the ingresses? Oh, I know what it was. We didn't change the application. Ah, maybe I'll pull it off. 
Maybe I'll pull it off. Nano spin app. Okay, let's get down here. This isn't the name of the image. It's Squalachi uh, new JS function. X boom boom. Nah, nah, nah. Spin app. Okay, unchange configured. Apply nano watch, and it's running. Oh, thank goodness. And now if we clear and we run, let's do, we got a hey. So this one is at 8081. So now we do 8081. And in theory, in Kubernetes, one minute late, notice the lag time. I wonder if this is WSL or whether it's actually um, something else should be something else. If we get this, when I get this, control and curl 80, 81. Yep, it's there. So in fact, what we're doing is getting blocked by the, by the Kubernetes infrastructure. How many do we get? We got, uh, much lower request per second. You can see that there's something that went on in there in the in the cluster, but I'll wrap up with, uh, we're looking at 15 milliseconds there for, for the fastest request. In fact, once we get this, I'll get this figured out. You can see the fact is just chewing through them much more slowly. So we did it, but not perfectly. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I'm gonna keep working on this. If you're interested, go ahead and ping me on Twitter. I'm Ralph underscore, hey, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ralph underscore Squalachi uh, on Twitter uh, and uh, Squalachi on, in hackaderm.io for Mastodon. And I don't know, there's blue sky and there's email and there's the whole thing. Thank you Libby very much. And thanks everybody else. Thank you, Ralph, so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Again, thanks for bearing with us with the timing. And we will see y'all next year. Have a great rest of 2023. And um, we will see you for CNCF Live Webinars in January. Everybody have a great break.